the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Alice Bryant and Brian Lynn. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Alice Bryant. Mulan has been one of Johar Ilham's favorite movies since she was a little girl. She remembers sitting with her father a Uyghur economist and professor, to watch Disney's 1998 animated movie. Mulan tells the ancient Chinese story of a girl who tricks people into thinking she is a man so she can join the army. She becomes a great soldier. Now the new version of Mulan is out, starring Chinese-born American Liu Yifei. At first, Johar was looking forward to seeing the film. I was so excited about the live-action remake until one of my favorite actresses, Liu Yifei, publicly supported the Hong Kong police against pro-democracy protesters. Johar told VOA. In a social media post last year, Liu expressed support for Hong Kong police. The Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs welcomed the comment. But Liu's comment is only partly to blame for Johar's concern about the new movie. She is also upset that Disney filmed some parts of Mulan in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region of China. The Chinese government has been accused of severe human rights abuses against Uyghurs and other minorities in the area. Disney thanked local governments in the film credits, including the city of Turpan's Public Security Department. China's government is holding more than one million Uyghur Muslims in detention camps in Turpan. The U.S. government ordered sanctions against the department as a result. I have relatives and friends in the concentration camps. They might be in a camp near where the movie was shot, she said. China arrested Johar's father, Ilham Toti, on charges of separatism in 2014 and sentenced the human rights activist to life in prison. Rehan Assad is a Uyghur lawyer based in Washington, D.C. She is seeking the release of her brother, Ekpar Assad. She and other experts believe China imprisoned the 34-year-old in 2016, shortly after he returned to China from the U.S. He had taken part in a State Department program there. Rehan spoke with VOA about the release of Mulan. She said Disney's actions indirectly fund the Communist Party bodies that imprison Uyghurs. She said Disney's actions violate corporate social responsibility rules. To her, the release of Mulan is the latest example of Hollywood's readiness to ignore accepted values to do business in China. Disney wants to profit by a movie that empowers women, but it's praising governments 
who are committing crimes against women, against humanity. It's so hypocritical, she told VOA. In my eyes, the Uyghur women who are voicing out for their parents, brothers, sisters, and loved ones, they are the real Mulan, she added. The film has been the subject of intense public discussion since it was released on Disney Plus in the U.S. on September 4th. The messages Boycott Mulan and Boycott Disney have spread widely on social media. And a group of American lawmakers has demanded the leader of Disney, Bob Chapek, explain the company's cooperation with security and propaganda powers in Xinjiang during filming. Last Thursday, Disney's chief financial officer, Christine McCarthy, admitted the film's ties to China had created problems for the company. But Disney refused to comment further on the matter. On Friday, a representative from the Chinese Foreign Ministry said it's very normal for the film to thank the government of Xinjiang. He also praised the lead actress Liu Yifei, calling her the real daughter of the Chinese nation. China continues to claim the camps in Xinjiang are training camps aimed at fighting terrorism. Officials and civic groups have growing concerns about the influence China has had over Hollywood in recent years. They accuse Hollywood filmmakers of making changes to films so that China would be willing to release them. Some reports say filmmakers have invited Chinese government censors onto their film sets as advisors. Beijing has the world's second highest box office market after the United States. Hollywood Reporter magazine says American films earned $2.6 billion in China last year. Even with the political and social criticism of Mulan, the film was the top movie last week in China's theaters. Early estimates show Mulan made $23.2 million. In other markets, Disney canceled plans to release Mulan in theaters because of the COVID-19 health crisis. I'm Alice Bryant. The United States is offering to pay private companies to mine rocks and other resources on the moon. The U.S. Space Agency, NASA, published an official government listing for the mining proposal on September 10th. NASA officials are asking interested companies to collect rocks, soil, and other objects from the surface of the moon. The lunar materials would then be sold to the space agency. NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine says the project was created for the purpose of demonstrating that mined resources can be collected. He spoke at a conference organized by the Secure World Foundation, a space policy organization. The proposals would not involve private companies sending workers to the moon. Instead, NASA wants the businesses to provide robots to be launched into space by the space agency or 
private companies. NASA has asked companies from around the world to present proposals to collect 50 to 500 grams of lunar material from anywhere on the moon's surface. The companies will be required to provide images showing how the material is collected. In a statement published on a NASA website, Bridenstine said the agency's goal is to gain control of the collected materials before 2024. He added that officials would decide later how and when the materials could be transported from the moon. Proposals are not limited to American companies, and NASA may make one or more awards, he said. Bridenstein repeated NASA's goal of landing the first woman and next man on the moon by 2024 as part of the space agency's Artemis program. NASA also has set a goal of setting up a long-term base on the moon by 2028. From there, it hopes to launch a series of space operations, including possible flights to Mars. Last May, NASA released the main ideas for what is being called the Artemis Accords. It hopes the ideas can lead to an international agreement on how people will live and work on the moon in the future. Such an agreement could give companies rights to own the moon resources they mine. For example, businesses doing work for NASA could use the moon's water ice to produce rocket fuel or mine lunar materials for other purposes. Bridenstein said the agency's plans are permitted under the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which governs international space exploration. The treaty states that outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall be free for exploration and use by all states. The agreement bars any single nation from claiming ownership of such objects. NASA's plan to send robots to mine resources is meant to fuel a new era of exploration and discovery and help all of humanity, Bridenstine said. The space agency said it will consider the mined resources the property of the companies until they are sold to NASA. Then the materials would become the sole property of NASA. They are paying the company to sell them a rock that the company owns. That's the product, said Joanne Gabrinowitz, former chief editor of the Journal of Space Law. She spoke to Reuters news agency. She added that a company has to decide for itself if it's worth taking the financial and technological risk to do this to sell a rock. I'm Brian Lynn. Are you at risk of getting seriously ill from the new coronavirus? Here are some things to keep in mind. 80% of coronavirus cases are mild. Young and healthy people are at low risk. Other people and those with serious health conditions have a greater risk of serious illness or even death. If you have a cough, fever, and difficulty breathing, contact a doctor and stay away from other people. 
For more information, visit the World Health Organization website at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. From VOA Learning English, welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. James Madison of Virginia was elected President of the United States in 1808. He was inaugurated in Washington on March 4th, 1809. The people of the city were happy with the new president, but the nation was not yet sure what kind of leader he would be. Madison's first four years were not easy. He had to deal with a foreign policy problem that the former president, Thomas Jefferson, was not able to solve, increasingly tense relations with Britain. Historian Alan Taylor has written several books on early American history and has won a Pulitzer Prize for his writing. He says Madison took office under difficult circumstances. Jefferson in many ways was a tough act to follow because he'd been extraordinarily popular. But he had made one great uh, policy mistake with Madison's support. Madison had been his Secretary of State, and that mistake was something known as the embargo. The embargo had arisen from a war between Britain and France. The two nations refused to honor America's neutrality. Each tried to prevent the United States from trading with the other. Both interfered with American shipping and the British Navy sometimes seized American sailors. President Jefferson ordered a ban on trade with Europe, but the embargo failed to end the hostile acts against the United States. A month after Madison took office, the British minister in Washington, David Erskine, said Britain would stop seizing American ships if the United States would trade again with Britain. But Erskine did not make clear that the British government demanded several conditions. One condition was that the United States continue the ban against trade with France. Another was that Britain be permitted to capture American ships that violated the law. President Madison did not accept these conditions, but he still believed he had reached an agreement with the British minister. He announced that the United States would reopen trade with Britain. Hundreds of ships left American ports, but a few weeks later, Madison received surprising news. The British government had rejected the agreement he reached with Erskine. Letters were exchanged, but Madison could not get a good explanation for what had happened. He finally broke off all communications, and Erskine and his replacement left Washington. America's policy of trade with Britain and France continued to be a serious issue. President Madison approved trade with all countries in 1810. But when relations with Britain did not improve, he stopped trade with the country again in the spring of 1811. Trade was not the only problem, however. A growing number of Americans believed that the British were helping some Native Americans to fight the United States. 
As the people of the United States began to move to the northern and western territories, the government made treaties with the different Indian tribes. The treaties explained which land belonged to the Indians and which land could be settled by white people. The settlers did not always honor the treaties. Historian Alan Taylor explains that Indian tribes were trying to defend their homelands. He says they asked the British to provide them with guns and ammunition to fight against the American settlements. And the British were uh, playing a very ambivalent game. In other words, they wanted to keep the Indians on a kind of retainer in the eventuality that war did happen, they would want to mobilize those Indians. So they did provide them with guns and ammunition, but they hoped that the native peoples would just use them on the defensive. A leader of the Shawnee Indian tribe, Tecumseh, decided to unite all Indians and help them defend against the settlers. Throughout the West, many Americans believed that the British in Canada were responsible for Tecumseh's efforts. They demanded war with Britain to destroy the power of the tribes. In Washington, a new Congress was meeting. Some of the new members were very different from the men who had controlled Congress before. They were less willing to compromise and more willing to defend America's interests. They soon got the name War Hawks. At the same time, America had a new Secretary of State. Madison chose his close friend, James Monroe. What the United States did not have at that troubled time was a representative in Britain. The British minister in Washington, Francis James Jackson, returned to London when Madison broke off communications. The American minister in London, William Pinckney, sailed home as well. There was no official in either capital to report what was happening. And in the spring of 1812, the United States and Britain were moving closer to war. President Madison had hoped for some sign of compromise, but he was sure there would be war. He had seen the instructions from London to Britain's new minister in Washington, Augustus Foster. The foreign minister warned Foster to say nothing about any compromise. He wanted the United States to see how firmly Britain would stand against neutral trade with its enemies. Also, historian Alan Taylor says the United States did not believe Britain would stop inspecting American ships and taking away any sailors the British thought were British subjects. And because the British would not change that policy and the United States was determined to try to force them to change that policy, that's why the war happened. In the United States, Congress continued to prepare the nation for war. Lawmakers voted to increase the size of the army and to borrow money to pay for things the larger army would need. But not all lawmakers wanted war with Britain. Many Federalists especially opposed it. Congressman Hermanus Bleeker showed the House a list of hundreds of names from his area of New York. He said all these people opposed the embargo and the idea of war with Britain. It is impossible, he said, that we can go to war when the embargo ends 60 days from now. Where are our armies, our navy, 
Have we the money to fight a war? Why, it would be treason to go to war this soon, so poorly prepared. Treasury Secretary Albert Gallatin was having a difficult time finding money to borrow. He could get almost no money at all from Federalist bankers in the New England states in the Northeast. Congress had approved borrowing $11 million. But Gallatin found the banks would lend only $6 million to the federal government. The Federalists charged that Gallatin's difficulties showed that the people did not want war, especially the people of New England. If the people of the West and the South wanted to fight, then let them pay for the war. Yet, sure that Britain would not change its hostile policies, President Madison sent a secret message to Congress on June 1st, proposing that war be declared. Madison listed the reasons for war. British warships had violated the American flag at sea. The British Navy had seized and carried off persons protected by the flag. British warships also violated United States waters, interfering with American ships as they entered and left port. Another reason, he said, was Britain's orders against trade with France or allies of France. International law, he said, gave Britain no right to make such orders. Madison also spoke of the hostile Indians of the Northwest Territory and seemed to charge British Canada with helping the Indians. The President's message went to the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House of Representatives for discussion. The final vote in the House on declaring war was 79 for and 49 against. In the Senate, the vote was closer, 19 for and 13 against. President Madison signed the bill into law on June 18th. The War of 1812 had begun. The leaders in Washington did not know it, but two days earlier, Britain had ended its orders against neutral American trade. The orders might have been withdrawn earlier, except for a number of events. British Prime Minister Spencer Percival, under great political pressure, had decided to end the British orders on neutral trade. Businesses and traders were loudly protesting that the orders were destroying England's economy. On May 11th, before Percival could act, he was shot to death. Not until June 8th, was agreement reached on a new Prime Minister, Lord Liverpool. Eight days later, his government announced that the orders were ended immediately. This was only two days before war was to be declared in Washington, and with ships being the only method of communication, the British action was not learned of in time. If the United States had had a minister in London during the spring of 1812, the diplomat would have been able to report progress toward ending the orders. But the American minister, William Pinckney, had returned home a year earlier. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.